Hello there, this is Mr. Marek, and in this video we are learning about conservation of energy, which is probably one of the more important things that you'll learn during your time here in physics. We already know about work and how it relates to energy, namely that work is what causes energy changes within an object or a system of objects. So it should stand to follow that if there's no work being done on an object or a system, then the energy of that object or system won't change. That should be pretty self-explanatory. But wait, there's more. We have some special forces, which we're going to refer to as conservative forces, that can allow us to eliminate the need for work to be done or not be done in order to keep the energy constant. So a conservative force means that the work done by the force does not depend on the path that it follows. When that's true about a force, then we call them conservative forces. A good example of a conservative force is gravity. Let's suppose that we lift something against gravity, and as we lift it, gravity does negative 50 joules of work on it. So we lift it up, gravity pulls down, hence the work is negative. If we were to follow a different path, like maybe we were to slide it up a ramp instead of lifting it straight up, the work done by gravity would still be measured to be the same, still be negative 50 joules. So the work done by gravity depends only on the change in height, not the path that's actually followed. Therefore, gravity is a conservative force. Some other conservative forces, the force in a spring, the electric force, and the magnetic force. Right now we're just going to focus on the mechanical forces, so gravity and springs. Later on you'll learn about conservation of energy in electric fields and magnetic fields. If we have a force that is conservative, then what we do is we define a potential energy for that force. So we've already seen the potential energy due to gravity, We've also seen the potential energy in a spring. So the whole reason that we have those definitions of potential energies is because those are conservative forces. It allows us to take some shortcuts in problem solving and analyzing a physical system. So here's the big law. If the only forces we have are forces that are internal to our system, and conservative forces, then the mechanical energy of that system is going to be constant. And when something is constant, the fancy science word to express that is to say that it is conserved. So if we have only internal conservative forces in a system, then the mechanical energy remains constant. Now we can change that energy between different forms, so like gravitational potential energy to spring, kinetic, back and forth. Or we can transfer it between objects within the system, but the total is going to remain constant. So if we have an object, such as the Earth or a spring, that could cause a potential energy, we have to include that object as part of our system definition. Remember that we get to define what the system is, when analyzing a situation or solving a problem. So if we appear in a system to lose mechanical energy, chances are it's going to thermal energy, as in the energy that makes something hotter. That would be a form of internal energy. We're not discussing that yet, but we do need to understand that that's where it's going to go. And so if a question asks you how much thermal energy is created, well, that's just the mechanical energy that has been lost. One way that we can help, under, help ourselves understand what's going on in a system is to draw an energy bar chart. That shows us how energy is distributed within a system. So, as a simple example, let's suppose that we have a dart that's being launched from a spring-loaded dart gun. You know, typical child's toy. The system would have to include the dart, the object itself, the spring, and the earth. If we include those three objects as part of our system, the internal forces between the dart and the spring and the dart and the earth are conservative, 
and we can say that the energy of the system is being conserved. So maybe we shoot this thing up at an angle. And what we want to do is we want to draw a bar chart of how the energy is distributed. So when the dart is first loaded into the dart gun, all the energy is in the spring, spring potential energy. Immediately afterwards, most of that energy is going to go to kinetic. The dart is going to come out of there real fast. The way we've drawn our picture, some energy would become potential energy due to gravity pretty quickly because it would gain some height pretty quickly. As it goes up, the potential energy would go up. Therefore, in order for the total to be constant, the kinetic energy would have to go down. At its maximum height, it would have lots of potential energy, but still a little bit of kinetic energy because it would still be going forward. As it came back down, the potential energy again decreases, meaning the kinetic energy has to increase. As you draw these, make sure that all the columns add up to be the same height as whatever you drew for the height in the first column for the spring potential energy. So in other words, this total should be the same each time. Now when it hits the ground, the ground is going to do work and remove all the energy from our dart. The dart's going to basically stick in the ground, so it's not going to have any height, it's not going to have any kinetic energy, and it's not going to have any spring potential energy. And so now my bar chart would be empty. So a bunch of work is done, we're going to lose energy, or potentially in a different situation we could gain energy when work is done. So here's a second situation. We have an object at the top of an incline, and it's going to slide down the incline to the flat part, and then at the end of the flat part it's going to hit a spring, which is going to bring it to a stop. And what we want to do is draw a... So anyway, what we want to do is draw an energy bar chart at four different spots here. We want to draw one after we define our system, at the top, halfway down, when we're traveling in the flat part, and when it's stopped. So what I want you to do is press pause for a second, write out what your system should be, and then draw the energy bar chart at those four locations. Okay, so let's see if you defined your system to be the object. Um, that should read Earth. Object, Earth, and Spring. Initially, the object has a bunch of potential energy due to gravity. Halfway down, that energy split would be about halfway between kinetic and gravitational potential. When we get to the flat part, it will be all kinetic. And then when it hits the spring and the spring stops it, all that energy would be stored as spring potential energy. So we have to define our system to include all three things. And that way we can have the kinetic energy of the object, the potential energy due to the earth, and the potential energy due to the spring included. And then we can use conservation of energy to figure out what's going on. Let's look at like a numeric example. Suppose that we have a 4 kilogram object that's at the top of a 5 meter tall ramp. It's not only at the top of a ramp, but let's also say that it's moving at 6 meters per second. So a picture would look something like that. Now this is going to go down the ramp, and what we want to do is use conservation of energy to figure out how fast it's going at the bottom. So the first thing we have to do is define what our system is going to be. We have the object, and we have the earth. There's no springs involved, so I'm not going to assign them to be part of my system. we we'll put that in a little circle. We're going to draw an energy bar chart before and after it goes down the incline. Initially, I can figure out how much potential energy the object has by doing mgh. So it's a 4 kilogram object, g is 10, height is 5 meters, and so the potential energy due to gravity is 200 joules. I can find the kinetic energy by plugging into my one-half mv squared equation. 
the kinetic energy would be 72 joules. And so I'm just going to kind of put that on the bar chart to help myself out. Afterwards, my object has gone all the way to a height of zero, and so now my kinetic energy is 272 joules. The sum was 272 beforehand, and so after it slides down, since there weren't any non-conservative forces acting on it, the kinetic energy is still going to be 272 joules. I can solve for the velocity. Take the kinetic energy equation and get V by itself. It will be V equals the square root of 2K over M. So plugging in my numbers, we get something like 11.7 meters per second. If you take the time to define your system and then draw the bar chart before and after whatever interaction we're worried about, it'll make problem solving a little bit simpler for you. So this technique or this graph, whatever you want to call it, is sometimes referred to as an LOL graph because the bar charts look like L and your circle with the system in it looks like an O. Kind of cheesy, I know, but it might help you remember to do it. So a couple reminders before we wrap up. First, remember that you define the system, both the objects within the system and where you're defining your height to be zero. More generally, it also includes the fact that velocities are relative, and so you're defining what the kinetic energy is relative to. The second, draw an energy bar chart before and after whatever interaction we're studying to help you understand what's going on in the problem. If you come and ask me a question about a situation, I'm probably going to ask you to do that first. Doing that will probably help you answer your question. And then third, if there are non-conservative forces or external forces involved, then we have to go back to the fact that work is equal to change in energy. We would have to figure out how much work is being done on the system and therefore figure out how the energy is going to change. Obviously, we'll do a lot more examples and practice in class. I want to make sure we have a basic understanding. And so what you might do is go back to this example and see if you can go back through it again and punch all those numbers in, figure out all those energies again, draw those energy bar charts again, and see if you can get the same answers we got here. That's the end.